Fantastic. Thanks Thank very you. much, Andy. That's great. Great introduction there. Oh, you'll need to unmute yourself, sorry, ladies, to, to, to people to hear you. <laughs> sorry, that's my that's fault. <laughs> I was in full flow then. Um, so thanks, Andy. Sorry. <laughs> um, that great introduction. It, yeah, it'd be great for people to participate in the online questions. Um, so Charlotte, if you want to go to the first slide, hopefully everybody's had a chance to um, log in and get the link to that. We're going to be talking about coaching self-organizing teams today, and we're going to be doing this as a bit of a tag team, so a bit of a self-organizing team in our own right. Um, we have done a run through, so we know that we can do it in roughly about 30 minutes, but um, that's without a live audience. So anything can happen in a live performance, anything can happen. And that's a really good analogy for when you're coaching teams, because when you're in front of a team coaching them, you have to be prepared for anything because anything can happen because you're actually in the complex domain. And so we chose this picture because it probably represents uh, the web of complexity that coaching teams is all about. Um, so that's what we're going to explore today, the complexity of coaching teams, and we're going to be using a coaching approach to do that. So we're going to be starting by asking a question, and we like to have a bit of fun with our questions as well. So bear with us on this slide, but we thought it was quite amusing, so we hope you'll enjoy it too. Oops, we've got people in there already. Um, so the, the cats and the dogs and the mice are equal at the moment. Uh, so if you want to put your vote in there now, does, does your team currently use a team coach? Ooh. <laughs> My cat often does that to me. <clears throat> okay, so are we ready to, oh, we've, we've got a few more left to vote, so we maybe give a couple more seconds, Charlotte. Ladies, just to let you know, you've got about 40, 45 people in the session, just as okay. a, a marker for when you're doing the polls. Okay, so we've got about half of the, the audience participating. If you don't want to participate, Charlotte, I'll let you decide how long um, before you stop the voting. And it stopped. Woo! So we've got, oh, the cat's saying no. <laughs> so we've got five who aren't sure. We've got eight who don't use a team coach currently and 14 who do. So it's perfectly natural not to be sure about what a team coach is, uh, because until fairly recently, the last few years, probably um, team coaching wasn't really talked about as a particular um, aspect of coaching it's only come to the fore really in the last 10 years or so I would say so it's perfectly understandable if you don't know what um, team coaching is hopefully by the end of this session you have an idea in 30 minutes we're not going to be able to go into too much detail but hopefully you'll have a better idea by the time the the session finishes so Charlotte if you want to take us on to the next question so what is your role in the team? So we're going to give you a few seconds to answer this as well, just so we see who we've got in the room, because when we're coaching a team, it's really important to know who you have in the room. And I can see we've got some answers on the chat box. I'm assuming that you're not able to access the um, the voting so thanks very much for letting me know that okay how are we doing so again Charlotte I'll let you decide when you're ready to close the voting okay so we've got predominantly um, scrum master coach and agile coach Interestingly, people are identifying as coach rather than team coach. Um, so that's also interesting in its own right, because how we identify as a coach is important um, because that determines how we actually coach the team um, in terms of where we're coming from as well. So that self-awareness of our role as a coach is really important. So thank you for that. So let's explore a little bit more then. What do we mean by coaching? So for those of you who are already coaching, you're probably with, familiar with... Um, Actually, you've gone, you need to go back a bit, Charlotte. <laughs> you got a bit trigger happy there. 
<laughs> um, so you're already familiar with what we mean by coaching um, but for those of you who maybe are doing a different role maybe if you're a project manager you're a team member you may be not familiar with the the concept of, of coaching so we're using a definition from a guy called Joseph O'Connor and um, a woman called Andrea Largis in a book called How Coaching Works and if you want to go onto that slide Charlotte if you can find it and it's disappeared for some reason. Why has it disappeared? I'm not quite sure why the slides disappeared. It was, there we go. Oh, I was starting to panic then. Um, so, oh, so that's because we missed our question, didn't we? What is, what do you think is the core role of a team coach? Okay, let's go back then. Sorry, I was getting ahead of myself there. Facilitator for flow, program manager, answer insightful questions, offering feedback to listen. Yeah. Great. So listening and asking questions, helping the team grow and be more effective in the way they deliver. Fantastic. Awesome. Transparency into the light, facilitation. Oh, we've got a fantastic team here today. Brilliant. Great responses. Brilliant. Okay. So has everybody had a chance to vote who wishes to vote? Scroll down. Thank you, everyone. Okay, scroll down. <laughs> there are more, there are more. So we've seen the, the word facilitator there, and that's interesting. We'll talk about that later in the, the realm of coaching. One place to another, yeah. Brilliant, focus, gaps, problem solve. Okay, and we'll come to that as well in a minute. That's an important one to, to pick up on there. Brilliant. So now, if you want to go to the definition of coaching, Charlotte. So I'm going to give you a couple of minutes just to read through this. So I chose this quotation because it actually helps us understand when we're coaching, what we're there to do and what we're not there to do. So when we're facilitating, we are going in with a process that helps the client get an outcome, um, i.e. solve some sort of problem. When we're coaching, we're actually helping the client become more aware of the system in which they are working. In, in, you know, obviously, if it's, if it's um, life coaching, then obviously it's the system in which they're living. But what we're actually helping the client do is to see what's happening around them. So we're helping them understand how they actually generate the problems themselves rather than solving them so it's possible that when we're in a coaching session with the team we may not come up with a solution to the problem but what we've done is we've had dialogue and I'll come back to that concept of dialogue later so it's a form of process consultation and this comes from a guy called Edgar Schein um, who is one of the um, organization development founding fathers along with Warren Bennis and process consultation some of you may already be aware of what that is um, essentially is understanding both our internal and our external world and how our behaviors and actions actually affect a specific problem and how they affect our perception of that specific problem so it's enabling the client to get an insight and a lens into what's happening so what does this mean in team coaching so if we go to the next one Charlotte where we talk about team coaching specifically this again is from Peter Hawkins leadership team coaching in practice I'll give you a couple of minutes to to read through this So what we're doing when we're working with a team is we're actually helping them achieve these things through understanding what's going on, building that self-awareness. And we might be coaching the team together. We might be coaching the team members individually with a, an, an aim of actually bringing them together. We're always with that question, how is the team working together? And what are the conversations, to use David Clutterbuck's um, phrase, what are the conversations the team needs to have together to move forward to solve this particular problem or to do whatever it is that the team needs to do? So there are two leading definitions for what we mean by coaching and team coaching in particular that help us understand what our role is as a coach in, in coaching those self-organizing teams. One of the things we talked about in our um, 
blurb was holding the space. So this next question really is to get you to think about what does holding the space mean to you? I'm not sure if that's a question or if that's actually an answer. If it's an answer, it's spot on. <laughs> so you can take that. Yeah. So hopefully I'm holding the space a little bit for you to have some thinking time. I'm conscious of time as well because I don't want us to, to overrun. These are great answers though. Um, this for me in coaching, whether it's individual coaching or team coaching, this is the key tool that we use as a coach, holding the space for the team to do exactly those things that you talked about. And we'll talk about some of those things later, particularly around psychological safety. Fantastic. And I, I really like that answer at the beginning, that hum, uh, because that is exactly what it is. And sometimes it takes confidence and it takes um, uh, bravery to allow the, the conversation just to happen naturally and allow that silence and space for people to think and just be. So we'll give a couple more minutes for people to contribute. I love the fact as well that even if you don't know, you, you're putting an answer in there. That's great. Because what that is doing is that's surfacing some of those thoughts that you're having. And it's getting it out there so that other people can actually hear those thoughts as well. Which then fills in that creating and supporting psychological safety. Brilliant. Awesome. You will get copies of these slides, by the way, later on. So you'll have an opportunity to review what everybody has put in the, the answers, um, because this is, this is your work that you're creating as well with us. We're co-creating this together. Um, so you'll have access to this in the, sh the shared space afterwards. So thank you for that. OK, so Charlotte, do you want to go on to the next slide, which is our working definition of holding the space? And essentially, you covered all of these things in um, the comments that you gave. So I'm not going to, to make any further comment on the, the definition. All I will say is that holding the space is enabling that dialogue that allows the surfacing of assumptions and it allows the opportunity for people to actually get to know each other and have communicate better communication. Often when we think about communication, we think about discussion of what we're doing in holding the space is we're allowing the space for dialogue, which is more than just the words. It's about understanding what people are saying and seeing them and getting them. So when we allow that space to happen, it's about creating that space for getting people within the team. It's understanding them. I see you, I get you. I see the team, I get the team. Okay, so how do we do that as a coach? Well, there are many ways that we can do that. And facilitation was one of the things that came up earlier. And I just added this in because often, and, and I'm sure if you're an agile coach, you'll be familiar, familiar with the agile competency, agile coaching competency framework. Um, this really gives you some sort of hooks into what might you be doing if you're doing those particular things. And when we're coaching teams, we have to be flexible in what we do. We probably inhabit that consultant role a bit more. Um, and really we should be sort of doing 80% of the time coaching and maybe 20% of the time doing a mixture of all the other things. And we'll use our judgment and flexibility to work out what's what. So again, you will have that slide. These are just examples of the different things that you might be, the questions that you might be asking, what you might be doing. So you can identify when you're going into that mode. Ideally, as I say, you want to be in that coach mode more often than not, because if we're creating, helping create co, um, 
self-organizing teams. We want them to be able to coach themselves. So let's just ask you a question again then, which, you know, even if you're not a coach, what's your default intervention style? Given those choices, which of those is your default intervention style? You know, if you're in a meeting, which one of those do you think you might be inhabiting more often than not? Fantastic. So at the moment, we've got slightly more facilitating than coaching. And that, to be honest, that, that is understandable. Um, coaching is a very, very specific skill set. Um, and it's easy uh, to, you know, as a facilitator as well, it's, it is easy to go into that facilitation mode. And the, again, the key thing that we have to remember is that we're always working with a view to helping the team be able to coach itself. And that leads into our prime directive as, as team coaches. Prime directive is exactly that, that we leave the team capable of coaching itself. So by the end of the coaching assignment, um, the team is able to coach itself. We, you know, they don't become reliant on us. They're able to do it for themselves. And you probably spotted there that I said assignment. So when we're coaching teams as well, we don't want them to think that we're going to be there forever and a day. It's not a job. It's actually a role that we're performing. Um, yes, and I agree that somebody's put a comment on it does depend on the maturity of the team. And that is exactly it. Um, it does depend on the maturity of the team. And it's also about working with the team to help them understand so that they can then move to that next stage where they're actually capable of coaching themselves. So you might do things in the sessions that enable them to actually take over and do things for themselves, or you might ask them to come up with something themselves rather than you offering it in a facilitation mode. So that's the, the prime directive for any Star Trek fans out there, you probably spot the, the link to um, Star Trek. Uh, moving on, <laughs> just in case there aren't any fans out there and we lose people on the audience. <laughs> Um, so we promised you three paths for helping teams create great coaching habits. And these are what I call the trifecta of teamwork. Um, you know, you're always going to have something around decision making. There's always going to be something around conflict because it's humans. Hey, it's a complex system and psychological safety. So let's go into decision making first. And again, a question for you to think about. And there are, by the way, there are no right or wrong answers. So what do you think, in your personal opinion, what do you think a team coach needs to know, be or have to help the team make decisions? You could scroll a little bit, Charlotte, so we can see the answers, please. Thank you. Brilliant. Brilliant, yep. Brilliant. <laughs> I love that answer, nothing. That is... That is a, a, a really deep answer that, because at the end of the day, you don't actually need to know anything. You don't, I suppose you need to be something which you probably do need to be brave, um, particularly if you're going in thinking that you don't need to know anything. Um, so you do need to be brave and you need to put aside your own um, fears and uh, biases if you can, and that's pretty difficult um, when helping teams make decisions. 
Okay, so if you want to move on to the next one, again, I'm, I'm conscious of time. So these are three things that um, I've sort of put there just as a bit of a tongue in cheek, but also it, it is in all seriousness. So you do need to know what the team's decision making process is. Um, you do need to help be able to help them understand how they develop that. You don't need to have a process. You're not facilitating your coaching. So it doesn't matter if you've never made a decision in your life. You just need to be able to help the team come up with a process that works for them. Um, and they might have, you know, a, a decision process that relies on consensus. They might have one that relies on majority voting. It could be anything. Um, but ultimately, the team comes up with the process. They could have something that they're using already. So you might ask them, you know, what are you using already? How is that working for you? What would you like to change? What's the feedback you've had from people outside of the team that might be affected by decisions? Could be a whole host of different questions that you might ask the team. Um, the key thing is that it's about creating dialogue. Um, so you want to make sure, again, that you've, you've created that space for them to have those conversations and that you've enabled them to come up with a process that works for them. The second thing is that they all need to commit to the outcome of that decision. So if they don't commit, um, then a decision hasn't been made. So it's no good that, you know, they say in, in the session that they've all committed to an idea or decision. And then outside of the session, immediately somebody starts to badmouth the decision because that isn't commitment. So again, you might use a very simple tool, one to 10 scaling. Where are you on one to 10? Where one is, I hate this idea to 10 is, yeah, I'm going to really make this work. I'm going to work together with the team. Where are you on that? Just give a sense check. And there are a million and one ways of how you can do that. You can do it anonymously. You can do it in the group, in the team together, which obviously is the ideal way of doing it. Okay, so decide, commit, and then repeat. So once they've found something that works, obviously repeat it and obviously review it to make sure that it's still working. So you keep that freshness of thinking. So let's go into the next one, Charlotte, which I think is another question. What are all the possible sources of team conflict? So decision-making can also be a source of, of um, <laughs> conflict in my experience. So what do you think are all the possible sources of team conflict? <laughs> Jira. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. 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 <clears throat> Cake. <laughs> That's serious though, because I, I remember somebody telling me that, that they, um, having cake in the office was a real um, challenge for them because they were trying to lose weight and it was a real point of contention. Please don't bring cake into the office. It makes it hard for me. So that could be a very serious point of conflict. Okay, fantastic. So let's uh, go into the next slide then, Charlotte, if we may. So <clears throat> what, what I've done with this model is really just to um, percolate or curate information that I've read about conflict within teams and percolate that into a very simple way of categorizing possible areas of conflict. And I know when we're, we're working in complexity, it's maybe not that easy, but it just it's, it provides a way of having the conversation. So you've got sort of four areas. And if you look at... Um, the, the answers that you gave before, most of those could actually be pulled into one of these um, different category areas. So I'm not gonna say too much more on that because I wanna give Charlotte a chance to actually speak. So I apologize Charlotte for taking longer with that. Um, and I'm gonna hand over to you because the one that's in the middle there is psychological safety. Thanks Ro. Uh, so yes, in the, in the last five minutes, I'm gonna quickly just go through the, the final piece of uh, the, the three items, which is psychological safety, which I think quite a few of you mentioned at the beginning as well around uh, that uh, holding the space. What does it mean around psychological safety? So another quick poll. So what does so psychological safety mean to you? Right. Yeah. Trust, room to fail. Everyone can be heard. Speaking without fear. 
Great. Fantastic. Okay. So absolutely great, great, some great answers there. Authentic self, absolutely. So um, many of you may have been uh, familiar with the person that sort of coined this phrase, although psychological safety has been around in some shape or form for a very long time. Um, but the person I'm talking about is Amy Edmondson. Um, and in her definition is really around that it's her belief that it's absolutely okay. And you're actually in, in a team environment expected to speak up with any concerns or questions or with ideas or with mistakes. And if you visit her YouTube um, and her TED talk around psychological safety, she just gives very three clear examples of where when psychological safety is not present, then there can be absolutely catastrophic um, consequences of that happening. Uh, we're not all working necessarily in those fields, um, but when we don't have psychological safety, we can end up with, um, unfortunately, to the extent of actually people dying if there's not that psychological safety. Interesting, people somebody put about trust. The difference between trust and psychological safety is trust is that individual to individual. It's a very personal uh, relationship. Psychological safety is about that many um, being together. Um, and for those of you who've worked in psychologically safe teams and teams that are not psychologically safe, you really know what that feels like. Um, and yes, I was very fortunate to work in an amazing team early in my career where that psychological safety was absolutely present. And then more recently as well, and many times worked in teams where it's not. So um, this is another uh, definition around psychological safety. It's an individual's perception of the consequences of them taking an interpersonal risk. So if you go to Amy's talk, one of the, there's the three things that she talks about in terms of creating a climate of openness, which is what we're really meaning in terms of psychological safety. One is taking a thinking frame so that it's a learning problem. When problems arise, it's more around it's a learning opportunity rather than an execution problem. But we've probably all been in that situation where if something comes up, there's a problem, people are looked to individuals or something to blame. Um, that is around execution. Creating a, that climate of openness means you actually take a different stance, that you're actually thinking it as a learning opportunity. That also leads into that beginner's mindset. So we have a curiosity, which also links very clearly with coaching, because when you're coming in from a coaching stance, you're coming in with that curiosity, wanting to ask lots of questions. And thirdly, is that awareness frame. That self-awareness is absolutely key for that psychological safety, being aware of the impact that you have on others, but also acknowledging that you're fallible. We're human beings, we make mistakes and that's okay. But you stepping up, being in the team and saying, actually, yes, I, was, I failed, that's fine. I'm comfortable with that, but I've used that as a learning opportunity. So there we go, three simple things for psychological safety based on Amy's uh, Edmondson's um, perspective. So coming, wrapping up now, so how, based on what we've just talked through, how will you know when the team is ready to coach itself? And I think this is a multiple choice, so you can have up to four answers on this. Fantastic, okay, so we've got, in there we have four key ones that are running ahead. So when is the team ready? Okay, so we have, at the moment, we've got able to co-create a safe environment. We have co-coaching in pairs. We have simple session framework in place and we have a team learning plan. They seem to be the four main contenders. Yeah, it's fantastic. Okay, so I'll close the voting and here we go. The answers are one pot potential answer, our thoughts on the process and on leaving the team. So if the team is capable of coaching itself, there's already from you as a team coach perspective, agreed a front upfront timeframe when you're gonna transition out. And so there's a clear pathway for when the team will be left to self-organize and coach themselves. There is a simple session framework. So that simple framework is in place. There's also agreements and expectations of how the team will work together when you as the team coach step away. And also there is a team learning plan that's updated at each session. So there's that real focus on that continuous learning and improvement. So 
there you have it. That is our talk for today. Um, apologies, we've gone slightly over. We basically covered around the core role of a team coach, what it means to hold the space, um, the different intervention styles from coaching to consultant consultation and the three paths to actually helping you create um, co great coaching habits, which were decision making using creative conflict and also psychological safety. And finally, the four ideas of how you can actually then know when your team's ready to to coach themselves. So on that note, um, open to any questions. Um, we'd love you to connect with us on LinkedIn. Um, um, I don't know, I haven't seen any questions at the moment, but um, I'm going to be dropping into the uh, room anyway to Wello and I'm happy to answer questions there as well.